Hey everyone, my name is Felix Rogotsky, and I'm a 10th grader at Aubrey Cal High School. I'll be doing a presentation on the solar wind show. Alright, so the sun. Astrophysicists classify the sun as a star of average size, temperature, and brightness. Due to the very high temperatures found in the sun, these elements exist not in the gaseous state, but as plasma. Such elements include hydrogen and helium. The sun's corona is the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. The corona is usually hidden by the bright light of the sun's surface that makes it difficult to see without using special instruments. However, the corona can be viewed during the total solar eclipse. The vast amounts of energy emitted by the sun come from thermal nuclear fusion, reactions occurring within the core that convert hydrogen nuclei into helium nuclei. But I'm, I'm sure most of us can do that. It has been calculated that the energy output of the sun is 3.86 times 10 to the 23rd kilojoules per second. That's a lot of energy. Temperatures within the sun's corona are extremely high, giving some of the charged particles present sufficient energy to escape from the strong gravitational pull of the sun. This stream of charged particles emanating from the sun at speeds of around 400 kilometers a second is called the solar wind. It's rapidly moving plasma that pushes out to the edge of the solar system. Each day, we, con we consciously experience atmospheric weather driven by radiation from the sun. The solar flare is a sudden, explosive release of high energy particles and radiation from the solar atmosphere. It increases the volume of X-rays and UV light reaching Earth. The term space weather refers to the variable conditions on the sun and in space that can influence the performance of technology we use on Earth. Here, we can see how the space weather can impact stuff on Earth. The X-rays can interfere with high-frequency radio communications and the, and the ultraviolet light that result in heating of the upper atmosphere, causing it to expand further out into space. Satellites below orbit Earth now experience increased drag due to a denser concentration of plasma particles. This alters the orbit of the satellite. If appropriate alterations to the orbital path cannot be made, the lifetime of the satellite can be substantially reduced. Space weather can produce electromagnetic fields that induce extreme currents of light, disrupting power lines, and even causing widespread power outages. Severe space weather also produces solar energetic particles, which can damage satellites used for commercial, communication, global positioning, intelligence gathering, and weather forecasting. The solar wind is the movement of charged particles across the solar system. As I said before, the particles' velocities are highest over coronal poles, areas near the sun's pole associated with open magnetic field lines that allow material to flow more easily into space. Particles move flow out more slowly near the sun's equator, where magnetic field lines loop back on themselves and trap coronal material. Depending on the activity within the sun's outer region, the density and speed of the solar wind can vary from 5 to 100 protons per cubic meter second, with speeds between 200 and 800 kilometers per second. On a typically average day, the speed of the solar wind is about 400 kilometers a second, and its density is about 10 protons per cubic centimeter. Countries with investment in satellite technology monitor space weather through a number of agencies such as the NOAA, the WN, the NWS Space Station Prediction Center, NASA, and the European Space Agency. Several New Zealand internet sites take real-time feeds from these, N from these agencies and broadcast them. The Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field play crucial roles in subduing the damaging effects of both the electromagnetic radiation and the solar wind that continue to the streams out of the sun. Our magnetosphere plays the role of the gatekeeper, repelling this unwanted magnetism and energy that's harmful to life on Earth, trapping most of it a safe distance from Earth's surface in twin donut-shaped holes, zones called the Van Allen zones. So, the solar wind actually protects us from cosmic rays from other places in the universe. 
However, like as I mentioned before, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. So it doesn't have adverse effects on our electrical systems. And the magnetic field redirects solar wind to the poles. And that's actually why you can see aurora borealis up there in the, in the North Pole and South Pole. Now, a coronal mass ejection is a bit different than regular solar wind. A coronal mass ejection can release huge amounts of matter and electromagnetic radiation into space above the sun's surface. The ejected material is plasma containing the machinery of electrons and protons moving at speeds in the region of 600 kilometers a second. When this interacts with the Earth's magnetic field, it can cause magnetic field fluctuations that generate rogue electric currents in power transmission lines, submarine communication cables, and cross-country pipelines. If large enough, these electrical currents can have substantial effects. CMEs can cause surges in electrical currents, which overload power grids, causing widespread blackouts. According to NASA, CMEs can jostle Earth's magnetic field, which can impair radio transmission and increase radio wave static in Earth's ionosphere. GPS systems are particularly vulnerable to disturbances in the ionosphere, and GPS coordinates have been known to stray by tens of feet during a CME event. The Carrington event happened in 1859 when a massive coronal mass ejection hit Earth. There were even reports of operators receiving electric shocks and sparks showering from the telegraph machine and setting papers ablaze. Interesting that in, 18, in, 19, in 1859, in 1989, this coronal mass ejection accompanied a solar flare that hit Earth, plunging the entire province of Quebec, Canada into an electrical blackout that lasted 12 hours, according to a NASA statement. The event cost Quebec utility company, Hydro Quebec, at least $10 million in damages. Here are a few photos so you can see what would probably happen if a similar storm happened today. Cities would look would look like that with the brilliant colors of the northern lights. All right, so in 1957, Eugene N. Parker, an astrophysicist, actually theorized the existence of the solar wind. He described that particles were being emitted from the sun's surfaces. He actually did some math and figured out that if the sun's atmosphere really was a million degrees, then particles would come out of the corona as solar wind. And then a NASA spacecraft called Mariner 2 took readings on its journey to Venus, confirming his theory. The solar wind is a collection of streams of energetic particles that originate on the sun. Ulysses spacecraft measurements show that the solar wind has a fast component and a slow component. The slow wind has a speed of about 400 kilometers a second, and the fast component is about 800 kilometers. Note that although the solar wind is electrically balanced, the solar wind consists almost exclusively of charged particles, which are particles that are stripped away, which are stripped away nuclei from atoms, and is an, and they're actually excellent electrical conductors. Yeah, these electrically conducting particles are technically known as plasma, so it's kind of misleading to say that the solar wind is a wind. The Heliophysics System Observatory contains a fleet of spacecraft designed to study our dynamic solar system. The missions, the missions study the sun and its influence in the solar system, including the effects of solar wind. And actually, the Parker Solar Probe is actually out on a daring mission to see what happens when the sun is touched. And the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory joint effort between NASA and the European Space Agency in order to study our sun somewhere. And the Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, also known as STEREO, also consists of two near identical observatories, one located ahead of Earth's orbit and the other trailing behind and east of the solar orbiter that is taking a first time look at the sun's uncharted polar regions. Yeah, according to NASA, 
The mission is to understand everything from how planetary atmospheres are formed to how space weather can affect astronauts and technology near Earth to the physics that define our neighborhood in space. The tools that NASA employs to do this are brand new picture right there, and they're constantly evolving. And in the future, in about five billion years or so, the sun's core will run out of hydrogen, the fuel of its fusion reactor. Then, the sun just turns into a red giant, which will, destroy, which will destroy Earth, and then it will turn into a white dwarf after a planetary nebula. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.